On this episode of This Week in Linux, we've got a great show for you, even though I am sick. As they say in the show business, the show must go on, or something like that. I don't know what it actually is. Something like that, though. I've heard it that way, at least. But anyway, up, up, coming on this show, Lenovo adds Ubuntu laptops and PCs to their lineup. UB Ports OTA 13 has been released, and we'll talk about that for Ubuntu Touch. A Puppy Linux 9.5 has been released, and it's going to be referred to as Fossapup. Microsoft is bringing Edge to Linux, which is so exciting for almost no one. Firefox 81 has been released, which I am excited about. Endeavor OS 2020.09.20. They're, they're, that's been released as well as a new ARM edition of Endeavor OS, which I'm ex very excited to play with. GNOME has decided to change their version numbering to so the next release is going to be GNOME or GNOME 40 versus so it's 3.38 now. The next one's going to be GNOME 40. We'll talk about that and why they did it. Caliber 5.0 has been released. Flameshot 0.8 has been released, and this is a screenshot utility that I'm a big fan of, and we'll talk about the latest release and what it brings. Lightworks Video Editor goes independent from the, the previous company of EditShare, and we'll talk about what that means for the application. All that and much more on your weekly source for Linux. Good news. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean and by Bitwarden. Welcome to episode 118 of This Week in Linux, a weekly Linux news podcast, a part of the Destination Linux network. I'm Michael Tunnell, and if you're new to the show, this is a show that will keep you up to date on what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take on the latest topics using my over 20 years experience as a Linux user. Before we get started this week, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, I just want to make it clear that I am sick, so there might be times where I kind of go off into a weird tangent, and don't hold that against me, hold it against the sickness. It's not my fault. It's the sickness fault. There we go. And secondly, uh, This Week in Linux is back to live streaming. So if you're not aware, every Saturday and we do this show live. So come join me in the chat room, uh, whether you want to be it on Twitch or YouTube. We're on both. As well as if you're a patron, you can join me in the Zoom room and be a part of the stream itself. So you can learn more about that by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. And also, if you haven't heard about my other podcast, I'm also on Destination Linux podcast and Hardware Addicts. Destination Linux is a great discussion conversational show about Linux and open source, and it's just a fun time, so check that out. And if you're interested in hardware, or you're an enthusiast of hardware, or just interested in all, you check out Hardware Addicts because that is a fantastic show that will teach you all kinds of stuff about hardware. It teaches me all the time because I'm not really a hardware person. I'm more of the software guy learning about hardware, so that is a fun show for me to be on as well, so check that out. And also, if you'd like, you can follow me on Twitter or Mastodon. I'll have a link to both of those in the show notes and in the description for the video. And if you can you can choose whichever one you want because I basically post on them equally. So whichever one you prefer, that's the one to check out. So follow me on Twitter or Mastodon. Uh, first in the show this week, we're going to talk about Lenovo adding Ubuntu to their laptops and PC lineup. So Lenovo now is making 27 PCs, that's 13 workstations and 14 laptops, available pre-installed with Ubuntu. So to quote Igor Bergman, the vice president of PCSD Software and Cloud at Lenovo, he says that, our goal is to remove the complexity and provide the Linux community with the premium experience that our customers know us for. This is why we have taken the next step to offer Linux-ready devices right out of the box, which is great. And another thing that's, that's great about this is that Lenovo has said that they now are doing end-to-end -end web and phone support for Linux platform-related issues, which is fantastic because a lot of these big companies will ship Linux on their uh, computers, but then also not really do a support service as well. But this Lenovo does seem to be all in on that, which is fantastic. So you can actually now get not only in just uh, Ubuntu for this example, there's also a Fedora laptop that you can get with ThinkPads and stuff like that. So there's a they're not just doing an Ubuntu release of Lenovo devices. They're doing a whole Linux approach, and and I hope they put more into it because this is just fantastic that Lenovo is taking this big step. And also Dean. Henrik Meyer, um, sorry if I messed that up, VP of engineering at Canonical stated about this news that 
Lenovo's expansion of Ubuntu-certified devices shows great commitment to open source and the Linux community, with data scientists and developers increasing needing, increasingly needing Linux for emerging workloads. This collaboration enables enterprises to equip their employees with the assurance of long-term stability, added security, and simplified IT management. I think the fact that Lenovo is doing, not only just doing the support for having it work on the devices, but also doing the technical support for those who have issues, they're going out to say that they are doing that support is just fantastic. And I thank Lenovo for joining the right side of history and supporting Linux and pushing Linux forward. Up next in the show is the latest news from Yubi Ports that 16.04 OTA 13 for Ubuntu Touch has been released. If you're not familiar, Yubi Ports creates Ubuntu Touch, which is an operating system for mobile phones, and it has a very high privacy and freedom respecting approach to mobile phones. It's basically an operating system for a Linux smartphone, such as the Pine the Pine phone from Pine64, which by the way, I love the powered by Linux thing on the bottom of this. Uh, that's just fantastic. But another cool thing about the UB, the UB ports uh, way, they're, they're also st uh, structuring it so that you can use Lomiri on uh, other operating systems if you want to, not just to be able to touch. So that's a really cool thing, which the Pine phone also supports, but that is a sidetrack. Let's go back to the topic. UB ports 16.04 OTA 13 for Ubuntu Touch has been released and there's a lot of new stuff, including new device supports for the Sony Xperia line where they have the Xperia, Xperia X, X Compact, X Performance, and XZ. They also have two new OnePlus devices where the OnePlus 3 and the OnePlus 3T, and they'll also all be receiving stable update channel. So that's mostly like, I'm not sure if they're flagship devices necessarily, but they are supported in the stable channel, which is fantastic. They've also added some new features to the release of OTA 13. There's a, an update to the Qt web engine system that has been updated, and they actually bring a new version of Chromium as the back end to, in, to improve the speed of rendering stuff for the Morph browser, as well as all web apps across the device. And they've also say that the browser is now 25% faster across all devices and using the improvements to the Jetstream 2 JavaScript and WebAssembly uh, benchmarks that they tested it on and improve the functionality of selecting text. This seems like a small thing, but every bit of polish is a great thing to have. So there used to be an issues of like being able to control exactly where you do the selection. Now you can do it and it's much easier. I, I do like that. And it's also now possible to do to open uh, downloaded PDFs, MP3s, pictures, and text files in the browser via the open button in the top right corner of the open with page. And also they've done some improvements to the UI as well for the browser. And they've done some improvements for like first impression and design overall for the, the core apps. So they've done improvements to the messages app, the dialer app and the contacts app and many more as well as additional fixes and ux improvements overall of the scope of the app of the of the operating system and if you've never tried ubuntu touch if you have a device to try it out and it's you you want to see if it can work as your daily driver for me i've tried it on the uh, one plus one which was a great experience i used it for three months for my daily driver and it worked out quite well i mean it still had some issues where it didn't have certain applications so it wasn't like it was the perfect solution but it still worked for the fundamentals and that's what's something that a lot of people are in like the casual user level could get get away with just having the fundamentals so i do think that ubuntu touch is a fantastic operating system so far for that kind of thing and also i haven't used it on the pine phone yet because i just got finished uh uh, uploading the uh, unboxing video, though, which is I posted that yesterday. So pretty soon I'll be putting a bunch of touch onto the Pine phone, as well as a bunch of other stuff, because you know I'm going to play with this phone a lot. So. I think that Ubuntu touch is in a position where it is ready to go for the fundamentals of a daily driver. If that's what you need, they're doing a lot of great work and I am excited for the future of the project and see what can happen with it. Because I think that Ubuntu touch has a lot of potential. And if you'd like to learn more about this or find like the release notes and that sort of stuff, I'll have links to all that in the show notes below. 
Up next in the show is Puppy Linux 9.5 has been released. So if you're not familiar, Puppy Linux is an operating system that is known for being very, very lightweight and also in an interesting style of functioning because it runs in RAM. So it basically just runs in your RAM and it also has a read-only uh, layered file system. It's very unique in terms of how it works in comparison to other Linux distributions. So if you've never used Puppy Linux, just know that in advance if you do decide to try it because it is quite different it's very cool and it also is very powerful in the sense of like it's a very lightweight distribution but it also is powerful in what you can do with it because of how it's structured that's hard that's a weird sentence to say but that's it is uh, puppy linux is really cool uh, it also uses a uh, jwm as its window manager so that's joe's window manager for those who are not familiar so it's not like it's not for somebody who is looking for the latest and greatest modern piece of software that sort of stuff but it is a really cool distribution. So if you want to check it out, there you go. This latest release has a minimum system requirement of 64-bit Core 2 Duo CPU and 2 gigs of RAM. It's known as Fossa Pup, based on Ubuntu 2004 Focal Fossa. And this is a uh, Fossa Pup 64 is the name of it. There's also, multi just so you know, there's a multiple different versions of of of, uh, of the different Puppy Linux branches kind of thing. And there's also a difference between an official version of Puppy Linux and also a, f a Puppy Linux family version. So like, um, let's see, there's Quirky Linux, there's uh, Debian Pup, and there's also uh, a, something else I can't remember exactly, but there's a bunch of them that are uh, of officially recognized as a part of the Puppy Linux family, but not official versions of Puppy Linux. So there's that. And also there's multiple different versions of the official Puppy Linux. So, you know, keep that in mind, whichever you go to download it. Just what basically go to the, when you go to the Puppy Linux website, there's a little frequently asked questions. Check that out for more details about that. Uh, but Puppy Linux is really cool. They've, in this latest version, they've done a re, re, fully rewritten init script for the initrd.gz structure. A new kernel update mechanism has been added, which provides greater hardware compatibility, UX improvements to Puppy pa Package Manager, new user interface and UI configuration tools, uh, additions, updates, and bug fixes, and that sort of stuff was also done to like different, uh, like a dozen or so uh, puppy specific applications and tool sets, and a bunch of other stuff like updating the kernel to 5.4.53. And also the modular build of Puppy Linux means you can swap out the kernel, the application, applications and the firmware very, very quickly. And they've also done an update to Joe's window manager or JWM is what they use. So there's quite a few things to check out. If you're interested in Puppy Linux, just keep in mind, it is quite different. It's very cool and very unique and powerful in the sense, powerful in the sense of like what it, you can do with it, but it's very cool. But keep in mind, it is quite different. So links in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. You can get started on DigitalOcean for free with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash dln. And DigitalOcean is optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and so much more. We actually set up some new droplets for the quality control platform as well as a new Zenotic server. So if you're a fan of Zenotic, the game, with the DLN community server is now available. So just check that in the multiplayer list. And we're running DigitalOcean droplet for that server, which was super easy to set up. And especially for me, because Ryan did it. So I, it was very easy for me because <laughs> I didn't have to, but DigitalOcean also made it really easy for him to do it as well. So this is just a, check it out if you are interested in the Xenotic gaming. Uh, DigitalOcean also recently announced new features for like the virtual private cloud or VPC, which is available for free. Uh, for free of charge in all regions. This lets you have cre uh, create multiple private networks to isolate workloads, which is very important. You can also get this, plus their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. But not just $5 per month, because if you want to get started, you can do so for free with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. Again, you can get started with that $100, $100 credit by spinning up over a, a dozen droplets to try out things, or even just some monster-sized droplets for two months, and just go to do.co slash dln to get that $100 free credit. And thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring This Week in Linux.
Up next in the show is Microsoft announced that they are bringing Edge to Linux. So their Edge browser is going to be supported on Linux, available starting roughly like next month as a preview release. So for those who care, which is maybe three or four of you, there is that information. Uh, I'm not really interested in trying out Edge, regardless of Linux or whatever. It doesn't matter because, you know, it's just a yet another uh, Chromium clone. So why bother? Uh, for those who are interested in using Edge, uh, please let me know in the comments below why you want to use our Edge on the system. I mean, I don't know. If you, so let me know if you, if you, if there is a reason. There might be, but to me, not really. Uh, they say that there will be initial support for Ubuntu, Fedora, and OpenSUSE and available as dev packages and RPM packages for those who want to use it. They also say that some features aren't going to be available, uh, like the built-in sync features is not going to be available, the read aloud features, differential updates, and some other things. They say that they're working hard to bring those those users the features as, as quickly as possible while also ensuring it's done right. Sure. They also say that GPU acceleration may come in the future as well. So if for anyone who wants to use Microsoft Edge on Linux, it is coming to Linux, which I think it's good that they're bringing it in terms of, you know, having support on Linux, the more applications, the better. But in terms of actually using Edge, no thank you. Uh, but if you do actually have a reason to use Edge and I'm just missing something, please let me know in the comments below. Up next in the show is Firefox 81, which is a browser I am actually excited about and use every day because it is a fantastic browser. And this, this latest release has a, a bunch of new features and improvements and all kinds of stuff. So they have uh, improvements to the VA API, which is for GPU acceleration, which I think is set by, by default now. And they also have uh, improvements to the media playback controls, which is just great. So it now allows you to uh, pause and play audio video in Firefox using keyboard shortcuts, as well as using the sound menu or Empress device. And it also uses, uh, able to use uh, connected headsets if it has player controls on the headset, of course. Uh, but this is really cool because in, if you're in another Firefox tab and you're, or in another application or you're on a, your computer is locked, uh, you, and you might have play, vi like video or audio playing in, in the background. This makes it possible for you to ma manage those uh, playback without having to go back to the tab and that sort of stuff because uh, it was annoying, but no longer a problem in 81, which is fantastic. Also, they have improved their, the design for the Firefox window. They've made some improvements overall to the default dark and light themes, but they also introduced a new theme called Alpen Glow, which is a colorful appearance for buttons, menus, and windows. And I have in the video version of this episode, if you're listening to the audio, I'll have links in the show notes, but for the video version, it is showing on screen right now. And also they've added something that's interesting. The For US and Canadian and Canada users, Firefox can now save, uh, manage, and autofill credit card information for you, making shopping on Firefox even more convenient, they say, and also to ensure the smoothest ex experience, this will be rolling out to users gradually, so you might not have it yet, but at some point you will if you want to use this. I don't really see a need for it, but for those who want it, there you go. And there's also something I am super excited about. And now this doesn't seem like it's that interesting and that important, but it actually is really, really cool. And that is support for Arc or Acroform. Acroform. So this allows you to fill in, print, and save supported PDF forms. And the PDF viewer also has a new fresh look for the latest thing, but this allows you to do this editing and filling in forms directly in Firefox. You don't need another a PDF editor or a PDF viewer or whatever, it'll have it built into the in Firefox, which is fantastic because there's so many times where it's very annoying to edit a PDF because you have to have the right application to support it and having it built into Firefox would be fantastic. So you just find a PDF, load it up in Firefox, edit directly in Firefox. I'm so excited about that. I know that it's a ridiculous thing to be excited about. Why is it that important? It's not, but for anybody who has to deal with documents all the time, it is just fantastic to have built in. So I am happy to see that. 
Uh, they've also done improvements to uh, browser native HTML5 audio and video uh, controls for accessibility features. So there's a lot of improvements for like screen reader stuff like that, which is fantastic. And they've also made some improvements to the picture in picture mode, which makes it easier for videos to be identified that they have the ability to do picture in picture, as well as they've done some like improvements to the dev tools for people who do web development. But the picture in picture thing is something that I didn't expect to really want, but it's really cool to be able to you know, use the Firefox browser, not have to pull the tab out and move it to another window and just click a button and then bam, it's on a different monitor and you can just like full screen that video on the other monitor while you're working on something. That is something that is just very, very cool. And if you haven't tried it, give it a shot because it it it, it will change your, your workflow a little bit, I think. Uh, if you do, you know, watch videos and listen to things for like, you know, uh, let's say, you know, tutorials of how to do stuff. You could have a tutorial on the side and then also do, uh, you know, your work on the other side and actually run through the tutorial. Let's say that's that's the purpose of it. Uh, yeah. So if you want to learn more about the latest release of Firefox 81, I'll have links to it for the show notes or links to the release notes in the show notes below. Up next in the show is Endeavor OS 2020.09.20. That's a very long uh, version number. And it's based on the date, but still, that's pretty long. And this is uh, actually uh, not just a release. It's also going to have a new ARM port that we're going to talk about. But before we get to that stuff, let's talk about what Endeavor OS is if you've never heard of it. So Endeavor OS is an Arch-based Linux distribution that is made it much easier for beginners to Arch to be able to use an Arch-based system. Endeavor OS comes with the Calamares, which is a very powerful and easy-to-use installer, which makes it a lot easier for an introduction to an Arch-based ecosystem. Now, when I say newcomers or beginners to Arch, I'm referring to as specifically beginners to Arch, not beginners to Linux. If you are brand new to Linux in general, I would not suggest anything based on Arch necessarily because of there could be some problems of the underlying uh, rolling nature of it being so constantly moving that it might not be the best way to get started. So there is that. Now, Endeavor OS is fantastic, and if you do want to use an Arch-based system, it is a good way to get started with that. So I will, you know, I'm not saying anything against Endeavor OS or even Arch. It's just brand new people. I would not suggest that. So there you go. But for those who are interested, the or not brand new, the Endeavor OS 2020.09.20 release has a bunch of new update updates to Calamares with like new slides and stuff. They also updated their NVIDIA installer, as well as they made something a decision that's pretty interesting. They decided to remove GNOME software and Plasma Discover in those editions because they're not they're they're no longer being installed by default. Now you still can get them from the package manager if you want to, but they're not installed by default. And they say the reason because in GNOME, Budgie, and KDE Plasma, they, it was brought it brought too much confusion. They say it brought confusion with new users thinking it was our software center when it's the a DE's software center. And it, it makes sense. Uh, they also say that uh, the update notifier, uh, they've made improvements to that, redesigned the scheduler that they can be set to hourly, daily, weekly, and monthly, and also better shows updates from the Arch Linux AUR or the Arch user repository. So if you have applications in that, it makes it easier to see when updates for that happens. And they've also done some improvements for the welcome app, like new buttons to change display resolutions, new buttons to bring up the Arch repo page, the AUR page to browse packages and that sort of stuff, which is very cool. They've also done a new thing about uh, creating an ARM edition of the Endeavor OS. So Endeavor OS ARM is a port of Arch Linux ARM, which if you're not familiar, Arch Linux ARM is not a part of the Arch Linux project. It's a separate project that just uses the name of Arch Linux with permission from that project. So Arch Linux ARM, or as I like to refer to it as their acronym, ALARM, it's fantastic acronym, is, a, is, is not necessarily officially a branch of Arch Linux. So just so you know. Uh, so this is a, a port of that, and they actually, in theory, support the same devices as Arch Linux Arms does. So Endeavor OS team, they say, is you know, it's a small team, so they couldn't test all the devices. So they say that they did test it on uh, many uh, single board computers or SBCs, such as the Raspberry Pi 4B, Odroid N2, N2 Plus, and the, U, and the XU4. So they have tested it for sure on those. So if you have one of those, it should be good to go. But they wouldn't, they're not able to test on everything because there's a lot of different, you know, intricacies to make something work on an ARM-based system. Because if you're not aware, ARM is a really, really good 
instruction set architecture type, but at the same time, it's very different. So like if you have something built for a Raspberry Pi, it doesn't mean it's going to work on an Odroid or an Arduino or whatever. It doesn't mean it's going to work on it just because they're both using, like if you have multiple ARM based devices, just because it works on one does not mean it was going to work on another one. So there you go. That's why the testing there does matter. Uh, so anyway, this new ARM version does support multiple DEs. It supports uh, GNOME, KDE Plasma, XFCE, Mate, LXQt, Cinnamon, Budgie, as well as the i3 window manager for those who would like to do that. So if you learn, learn, want to learn more about Endeavor OS and their new ARM edition, I'll have links to the sh in the show notes below to their latest announcement. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the open source password manager that I use and trust. And if you want to check it out, you can go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. And you might be wondering, why would you want to check it out? Well, password managers are a great way to have balance of security and convenience when using online accounts from various different websites and stuff like that. And you also should have a different password for each website, actually each account for each website, because you don't you don't want to have the the possibility of one account being attacked and then the data from that one also affect you in other things. So you want to have a different password for every single account on every single website. But that can be a giant pain to deal with, except if you have Bitwarden. So if you get Bitwarden, you get a, a lot of different conveniences. For example, you get an autofill password, so you can it'll automatically put the passwords in so you don't have to type it in yourself. It also will store the passwords for you in their vault, as well as generate the passwords for you with their password generator. And it works on mobile, desktop, browser plugins, and even the command line if you want to use that. So Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust, not only because it is a great service, but also because it is 100% open source software. And even if you want to self-host it, you can do that as well. But in, in addition to the open source aspects, they have security audits that every now and then they'll do, like they'll hire a third-party firm that will then scan through their code to have a companies tested to make sure it is as good as they think it is. You should make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. But if you're like me, though, you want to show your appreciation for signing up with a premium edition, premium edition, especially since that premium edition only starts at $10 per year. So thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux and the Destination Linux Network. Up next in the show is some interesting news from the GNOME project and that they are changing the version numbering for GNOME going forward. So March 2021 will be GNOME 40. And the GNOME 40 development cycle will have three releases, the alpha, the 40.alpha, 40.beta, 40.rc, and it will also have the first stable release going to 40 and all subsequent stable releases after that being 40.1, 40.2, 40.3, and etc. So that's how they're structuring it. And also in the next release of the, after that would, pro would be like September probably would be GNOME 41. And that in the same pattern for the rest of it would happen the same way. So this is really interesting because I it's the the reasons they were given for doing this are they kind of make sense, but they also don't really make sense for why they chose 40. So let's talk about that. And in based on the forum post, they gave the details of this. So they have like a quick uh, frequently asked questions in the forum post. So we'll cover that. So developer Manuel Bassi says, you know, first frequently asked question would be, why do we need a new versioning scheme? The answer, after nearly 10 years of 3.x releases, the minor version number is getting unwieldy. Now, this is true because it's 30.30 or 3.38, so fair enough, it is a big number. But at the same time, uh, does it need to go to 40? Not really. So we'll talk about that in a second. But the Linux kernel did do something similar because they, they were at like 2.6 point something for a very long time. It was like 2.6.27 or something like that. So the number... That number was technically lower in 2738, but there were more releases because the way that GNOME works or used to work was 3.38 was the release and 3.37 was the development period. So the even numbers were the release periods and the development periods were the odd numbers, which was, you know, fair enough. You probably should change the versioning scheme for that because it just makes sense to do that. But at the same time, the reason they went to 40 is kind of odd. So let's talk about that. So why start at 40? It says because the next version would be 33.40 and it's a nice round number, okay? The 3.38 release was the 40th release of GNOME, but this discussion came too late in the cycle to effectively switch. So we can say that if you start counting at zero, the next cycle would be the 40th release of GNOME. 
By using 40 as the base, we acknowledge what came before, and we don't introduce a large discontinuity in the number progression, which is somewhat the point of this change. Okay, so it's interesting that it's the 40th release, if you count it zero. So making it that um, changing it, I understand that as a, as a reason. However, not not we don't introduce a large discontinuity in the number progression is not accurate at all. Going from 3.38 to 40 is a giant discontinuity of number progression. So I don't get where that comes from. Your logic for using 40 because it's the 40th release, okay, sure, that's fine. But in terms of not introducing in a, an issue of discontinuity, it's going to do that. The doing 4.0 or 4.0, you know, 4 as the main number starting, that would be fine in terms of discontinuity. And you could just start from there and then every six months go from 4 and then go to 5 and 6 and then continue that way. That would be fine. You know, that would, because they do a six month release for those who are not aware. Every six months they make a new release, which is usually in March and September. Uh, so that's like that part would be fine. But going from 40, 3.38 to 40, uh, uh, it's creating discontinuity because most people are not aware of this whole 40th release thing. Almost no one probably. I would be. I think it'd be safe to say that most people have no idea what number the release was actually at. So at this point, I think it wouldn't really matter for the vast majority of people. But let's continue. So why not 4.0? The answer to that is. With GTK 4 being released during the next development cycle, calling the next version of GNOME 4.0 would have unfortunate unintended implications about the platform, especially from an engagement and marketing perspective. Now, to quick note here, most people don't know what GTK is. They don't know the difference between GTK and Qt. Don't know that GNOME has anything to do with GTK, which it does, by the way. GNOME actually is the, pro the project behind making GTK. They didn't create GTK, they took it over, but anyway, not important. But most people don't know any of these things or care. So the marketing aspect of it does not matter because most people don't care at all. And as long as you you know change one or the other faster than the other, it doesn't matter in terms of this one period of time where there might be a slight confusion for people who were somewhat aware of it, but most people aren't, so it doesn't matter in terms of marketing. Uh, we They say that we wanted to couple GNOME from the deep changes in the application development platform so that GDK can be released more often, which is good. It is good that they're doing that. And to provide long-term support major versions instead of delaying development cycles that inevitably end up into rewriting the world. So good that they're doing long-term support versions. That is very important. Uh, they also say that GNOME is not a technological platform, but also a set of design guidelines and ethos, and bumping the major version along with GDK does not reflect that. That's true. All of that is um, fair enough, but you can also update GDK faster. You can start them both at four, update GDK faster, and still have a different version numbering than GNOME. It, th this 40 thing doesn't matter. Like, I don't actually care. It's just when you're going to give reasons, just say, you can just say we want to. And that's enough. With that said, there are some concerns for why this is this happening could create problems. Now, let's talk about why. So there's some, some concerns distro developers and downstream packages have were they gave a bunch of different issues in July on when they first proposed this about this change. And the response to those, you know, those issues and concerns were less than ideal. So this is the quote from the response related to the, some of these concerns. And I quote, I think I wasn't exceedingly clear when I said that I honestly don't care about how downstream's packages know. So let me apologize for that, and I will attempt to clarify my position. I absolutely do not care what kind of contortions downstream packagers need to do when packaging GNOME. They are entirely free to change the version to match whatever requirement their particular packaging format has. Since everyone has its own interpretation of how version numbers are sorted, there is no way for upstream to pick one and be done with it. So that's that. So that's entirely pointless to try. Okay, I mean, there's no way to have everybody happy. Fair enough. Very true. But the idea that you don't care about what the developers have to do to make it work is just very rude and. I mean, fair enough, if you don't care, you don't care, at least you're honest about it. But at the same time, 
that's not the most ideal response that I would want. And also it says that they're entirely free to change the version to match whatever requirement their particular packaging format has. That would make it more confusing. Your entire purpose is to make this less confusing. So it's like, you know, you have this one version that it's easier to understand because it's 40, not three dot whatever. And you're making it more of like a full integer style. And then now you're also saying that it's okay if the downstream people change it to whatever they want, which would then defeat the entire point of it being changed in the first place. I don't get that. That's weird. So anyway, I don't think it really matters that they're changing it. I don't think it matters that it's changing it to 40. But at the same time, I think it's very weird how it's handled. So I just want to put that out there. If you want to change it, feel free. Best of luck with that. And there we go. If you'll learn more about this particular topic, I'll have a link in the show notes below for the forum post for both the time it was proposed where you can see those concerns as well as the uh, forum post where they announced that it was happening. So both of those links will be in the show notes below. Up next in the show is Caliber 5.0 has been released, and this is a big, big change for Caliber. This has been a year since the Caliber 4.0, and this has a bunch of new stuff. It's got enhanced search for the ebook viewer. Highlighting support for e- for Caliber ebook viewer includes colors, underlines, strike throughs, and more. They can also have they give the option to add notes to different things for the highlights, and all highlights can be stored in either EPUB files for easy sharing or centrally in the Caliber library for easy easy browsing. And in addition to that, they also added a new dark mode, which is fantastic to see. I am a big fan of dark mode in basically every application. I try to use it as much as possible. And when an application doesn't have it, it's kind of disappointing. Not a deal breaker necessarily, but it is kind of disappointing. So dark mode being added to Caliber is fantastic. Uh, for be clear, I might not have said what Decaliber is. It's an ebook reader. It's one of the best ebook readers on Linux. So check it out if you haven't. But this latest release also does this big change. That's why we're going from four to five. Is a big change of switching to Python three. So Caliber has been on Python two for a very long time, and this required a lot of rewriting and porting and stuff like that. So they say that this required porting at half a million lines of Python code and tens of thousands of lines of extension code to Python three. Some third party Caliber plugins have not yet been ported to Python three, so they'll no longer work. But as soon as they are ported, they will be working. And they have a link to various, like a page that lists out the the status of various different plugin uh, ports, whether they've been to Python 3 or not. And so you can, I'll have that link in the show notes as well. But this is great because Python 2 has been deprecated for quite a while and 3 is a lot more efficient and it's just a better version of the Python programming language. So it is good that they switch to it. It also means that it's more modular and just more, um, just more efficient overall. So this is great. And if you haven't heard of Caliber before and you want to look at an ebook reader on Linux, I think Caliber 5.0 is definitely worth checking out. And I have links to the various port update statuses as well as the announcement for the latest release in the show notes below. Up next in the show is Flameshot 0.8 has been released. This is a screenshot utility if you're not familiar. Flameshot is a really cool piece of software. It has so many handy features for like creating arrows so you can like point to stuff. It also has a new, a bunch of new features as well. And it also has, you can able to like resize the image capturing thing really easily. In the way that they lay out the tools are super simple and super easy to do because once you create the selection, it just loads all the tools around the selection really nicely. Depending on how big the selection is, it will just figure out where to put the buttons. It's very nice in terms of like just easy to use and have quick access to those things. Very cool. And also this newest version has added new features for a variety of things, including some stuff that I've been waiting for for a very long time. I've actually been using Flameshot for a while. We, uh, Flameshot was the software spotlight for episode 110 of Destination Linux. It's just great, but it also missed a few things. And the most important thing that it was missing, it has added now, and that is the ability to delay the capture. So you can have a couple seconds to delay to set up things that you want to be ready to go and then activate the capture and it will allow you to like click buttons and make menus pop up and stuff like that, where previously it would just like immediately start doing it. Now you could do the delay already in Flameshot, but it required you to do it through the command line rather than the GUI. And that just kind of made it cumbersome. It was still possible to do. It was just a little bit cumbersome. 
Now it's actually built into their new launcher system, which we'll get to in a bit. But they also added a, a, some inner key f a functionality to copy the image to the clipboard. There's also a side panel that lives the ability to add thickness slider. And if you're not familiar, the side panel in Flameshot is actually really cool because they, they made a button on the interface to actually open the sidebar, but previously it just activated with a sp when you hit the space bar, which was uh, uh, something I didn't know for a very long time was even there. So this is really nice that they added it to the GUI. Uh, they also added support for saving as JPEG and BMP files or bitmap files, which it used to just do PNG. Now it can do both. Also, In addition to PNG, it can do JPEG and bitmap files. And they also added the, uh, the launcher panel, which is the launcher and it gives you a bunch of options they're going to be adding more features to that launcher but right now its main purpose is to be able to control the uh, type of capture and as well as the um, the delay that you want to add if you want to add one they've also added a bunch of stuff like a new circle counter so you can just click a button it'll add a new number with a box around it saying like if you do like step-by-step -step instructions on the screenshot that sort of stuff very nice as well as they added a new pixelation effect so they replaced the blur tool with a pixelate a pixelate tool which allows you to pixelate the, like just really quick on the fly for data that you don't want people to see you know if you have some like sensitive data in the screenshot you can use the pixelate tool to hide that away and that is very very cool and in addition to all of these things, they also released Flameshot now as a snap, a flat pack, and an app image. So whichever form, and also it's going to be in your repos probably. So whatever format you want to use Flameshot in, you can now, which is fantastic. I think Flameshot is a great tool, so I can't wait to use it, you know, test it out on a day-to-day -day basis because the, the ability to do all the custom, like, quick annotations and stuff is very nice. So... If you haven't tried it, check it out. Flameshot 0.8 has been released, and I'll have a link to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show this week is that the Lightworks video editor has gone independent, and this is fantastic news for a variety of reasons. We'll get to all those in a second, but if you're not familiar, Lightworks is a video editor that has been the forefront of film editing in a lot of ways. It was used in a ton of different movies like Wolf of Wall Street, not a very good movie, LA Confidential, pretty good, Pulp Fiction, very good, Heat, very good. Road to Perdition, never watched it. Sorry, Hugo, also never watched it. King's Speech, also never watched it. So, no idea on those three. But, very big movies that Lightworks was involved in. So, why did I put in a review of movies in this topic? I don't know. But, that happened. So, continuing. EditShare has sold Lightworks to a new company called LWA, LWKS Software Limited. It's, uh, they sold it to this new company. It's kind of like a spinoff, and it's made up of former employees of EditShare who worked on Lightworks. So that's pretty cool. And it also has impro like it has potential to be very big news and good stuff for Lightworks. So Lightworks has this interesting position where it's a really nice, powerful editor, but it also is kind of rolling along rolling along pretty slowly in terms of like new releases and that sort of stuff, and also. It has a little bit of limitation that was created by the edit share company that made people not want to use it because they have a free version of the software, but you can only export a maximum of 720p. And I think that that's kind of too much, like too little of a, of a, of a limitation they should do at like say 1080p and just be it that way. Cause that means you're going to get way more people using it, more testing, more, you know, people involved in it and talking about it and that sort of stuff. 1080p is the better approach. I understand limiting in some way, like 4K is not as rampant and not as like ubiquitous as 1080p, but 1080p is needed. So hopefully the light new Lightworks company thinks that that is worth doing and they will consider that. That'd be great. So it's sold to a new company and this new company is, like I said, LWKS Software Limited, just rolls right off the tongue. Is made up of former employees who'd work directly on developing and promoting the software, so they are well qualified to support it, of course, which is great. Matt Stanford for Lightworks Product Manager says that it is great, it is with great pleasure that I can announce that the formation of WKLS Software Limited rolls right off the tongue. A new dynamic forward-thinking company dedicated to the content creation industry, Lightwork, uh, LWKS, is now the proud owner of Lightworks Editing and QScan Quality Control Systems, having reached an agreement to acquire the two business divisions from previous owner, EditShare. 
They So the next software update available for Lightworks will be in November. We'll see what happens with that. There's no word whether or not it will remain as a freemium app or if they're going to do it open sourcing because they did actually, like Edit Share said like 10 years ago, something like that, that they were going to open source it, but it never it never happened. And they gave reasons why it didn't happen it was because they needed to like change the code and make it more open, make, make it more possible to open source it and that sort of stuff. And they didn't get around to doing all that. I don't, I don't know. It's a weird phrasing, but that's kind of what they said. It's not verbatim. I'm not quoting them. That's just what I remember them saying. Anyway, so I think that this is there's a lot of potential for Lightworks. I think Lightworks is a solid video editor for what I've used it with. And the fact that it has big tra- a great track record for movies using it and that sort of stuff. But at the same time, it's limited in its lock of 10, uh, 1080p. If they could open that up, it would change the game completely. And I think they very much should do that, or at least considering it. Whether they open source it or not, I hope they do because that'd be fantastic. But whether they do or not, if they introduce the 1080p exporting, it will change so much of the availability and the interest in using it. Hopefully they do this. And I and I also think there's a lot of potential for this new company. because uh, They have a lot more writing on Lightworks, so they have more incentive to make it as good as possible. I think now with this new approach with the independent company, there's potential that Lightworks could become a much bigger player and I look forward to that, especially because they are there. It's a video editor, a professional video editor that runs perfectly great on Linux. And I love the fact that they do that. So if you're interested in checking out Lightworks and, you know, the, the current version, I'll have links to the, their, this, this post about the new uh, independent company, as well as the links to download it if you want to check it out as yourself. But, you know, keep in mind, there is a limit that you can only export for 720p if you're a free user of the application for the moment. Hopefully that does change in the future. So links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you'd like what to do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tux Digital channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux Everywhere t-shirt by going to dlnstore.com. That's right. The Destination Linux Network store is a very short dlnstore.com URL now. So if you are wondering why we had a really long one last time, we don't anymore dealinstore.com. And also we have other ways to contribute with any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find places for like links for places like Amazon, Private Interaccess, Humble Bundle, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. Also, if you'd like to see some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts, as I'm a co-host of those shows on the Destination Linux network. And just a reminder, this show is live usually every Saturday. So join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with the Destination Linux network. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. And I'll see you next week for your weekly source of Linux good news.